Welcome to another episode of Rocky's Ramblings, the show that encourages you to get out and do your own rambling. Get out and explore the many places to go, things to do, and events to attend right in your own backyard. I'm at Ferrum College today in Ferrum, Virginia, at the Blue Ridge Institute and Museum. And we're going to talk about what there is to see here at the museum and a very special festival that happens every year. So come with me as we find out what there is at the Blue Ridge Institute and Museum. I'm with Roddy Moore, the co-director of the uh, Institute and Museum, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, thank you very much. And I'm glad to be up here. We come up to the Blue Ridge Institute and Museum every year for a festival that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, but what I want to do is, is give the folks that are, are viewing the show an opportunity to see what it is that they'll get if they just happen to pop in the door here at the museum. We're open um, during the year, uh, Monday through Friday, but during the summers, uh, months of um, June through August, we're also open on weekends. And on the weekends, the Blue Ridge Farm Museum is open, and that represents uh, what a farm would look like in this region in 1800. Now, the Farm Museum is what's across the road from the Institute. Yes, and, and it's... And there's a museum in there? Well, uh, the uh, farm is furnished as a Virginia German farm would have been furnished in 1800 in this region. And our buildings are from the area that have been moved and restored. Uh, the furnishings are the type of things that would have been in homes in this area. Okay. And the garden are heirloom crops of things that would have been grown here at that time period. The, uh, our livestock, our oxen, our sheep, the pigs, the chickens are the type that would have been here. <laughs> Uh, that were, they were familiar with in that time period. And uh, also on the weekends, they uh, bake in the bake oven and cook on the open hearth as people would have uh, in 1800. Cool. Now, if you go over to the farm, is there someone there who can kind of walk you through that, or is it a, a self uh, We have costume direct. interpreters okay. uh, on Saturdays and Sundays and for special groups that want special tours. Okay. And so uh, that is open during the summer on Saturdays and Sundays. And we also have uh, different community groups that might want a special tour, and we do those for, for the people. Now, when we bring the school groups in, we do a different program of putting uh, the elementary school children in costume. Oh, that, so that that's, that's cool. It's more of a time machine for them. Of, uh, they're stepping back in history as in costume. Sure, gives them an opportunity to see what it's actually like. Yes. Yeah. So we yeah. have special programs for the elementary school children, and uh, we have different programs to different age groups that come through. But um, the farm represents what it would have been like here in 1800 uh, on the eastern slopes of the Blue Ridge. And cool. most people don't realize, but we had a strong dramatic uh, element that settled here. Sure. And so this farm represents that. So if you're looking for an opportunity to see what life was like 200, 300 years ago, um, come on up to the, the Farm Institute right across the highway from the main museum. Now let's, let's go back over to the museum, which is where we're at uh, for this interview. Um, when you walk in the door, what are you, what, what are you going to get? In the uh, Blue Ridge Institute, the building itself here, we have two galleries for exhibits. Okay. We have um, one gallery that has uh, the information about the Crooked Road. And we have two exhibits in that gallery, one on the different musical styles that you find along the Crooked Road. Sure. And that's a historical musical trail from Franklin County out through uh, Bristol, Abington, that area, and then right up to uh, the Ralph Stanley Museum. The, the Crooked Road is a wonderful opportunity to see the history of the, of the um, uh, music from this area. And if you go to my website, rockiesramblings.com, I'll have uh, some information there about the Crooked Road as well as all of the information about the Institute here. And then the second exhibit in that room are on the major families that sort of establish music and musical styles in that region, such as the Carter family, sure. the Stanleys, the Stonemans. So we have those exhibits in one room. In the second room, we do a rotating exhibit. And by the time this is up, uh, we'll have a new exhibit up on work in the Blue Ridge. Uh, there was a photographer that died about 20 years ago that took over 20,000 pictures in wow. the Blue Ridge of people working everything from 
broom making to quilting to apple butter making and we have his collection in the archive here and we're doing an exhibit on Earl Palmer and what was work in the Blue Ridge and more people think now of it as more as a craft or as a hobby type thing but quilting and apple butter making and sure. molasses making were things people did right. for survival for themselves and today it's more of a hobby but at in 1940s, 1950s, it was a way of life and a part of the farm work in the region. Oh yeah, now you said that that's part of the traveling, that's a traveling exhibit room now. That, so those rotate from time to time? They rotate usually yearly and we always create exhibits uh, upon this region. We just finished an exhibit on the early canneries in oh, this okay. area and yeah. um, that were established in the late 19th century in the 1880s, 1890s, and went right up until the 1950s when they were closed down. And all the counties around here had small canneries on the farms, sure. Absolutely. which was part of the farm yearly schedule. And um, they canned and they sold them to a distributor and the canned goods from this region uh, went all over the world. We're talking about traveling exhibits. We're talking about rotating from time to time. That's that's something that you've seen in other shows that I've done. A museum is not a static thing. It's uh, there are new things coming in all the time. So you always need to check the website, see what's new, and uh, so that the museum can be some place that you enjoy going from time to time. Well, uh, we just had a Dulcimer workshop this past weekend, and we had people from about 20 states here and uh, we have an herb workshop coming up in July okay. and uh, on herbs finding and how people used them and what they were used for. Um, we have a concert here that's a special concert wow. called Old World New World and we have a ballad singer from Scotland, one from Ireland, one from England and one from North Carolina wow. and we're looking at the ballad traditions in those countries as they came over here. Go to my website, you'll see, we'll put some information about yeah. that concert. Put that on your calendar to come to Farham, Farham College for that concert. But we're always doing different types of programs, sure. um, whether it's a special school program, whether it's a museum program, or whether it's a concert such as we're having, but sure. uh, there are always edu educational activities going on here. So if people walk in the door, they're, they're, they're gonna see uh, uh, whatever's on in the traveling exhibit room at yes. the time, and they've got the static displays as well, yes. and, uh, and then whatever is special. So make sure that you're checking out uh, the website so you can pick the, a time uh, to see what you wanna see. We're gonna take a quick break uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the uh, historical significance of the Institute here. I'm back with uh, Mr. Moore, and uh, we're going to uh, turn our attention now to the history of this institute. Uh, where did it come from? How did we get this here? Well, I think you have to go back and look at the history of the college. The college was started here more or less as a mission school by the Methodist Church. And how long ago was that? Uh, that was in 1913. 1913. And uh, it started as an elementary school for local children and then it went into a high school and junior college, and then it went straight to a junior college, and then to a four-year school. Wow. But the idea was that it was a place for a lot of people to come that maybe couldn't afford other places, and I think this college has more first-generation students than any college in the state of Virginia. Really? And there's been a motto here, not self but others, and it's always been that way of helping and working with others. Around 50 years ago, we got a president here, Dr. C. Ralph Arthur, and his sons were interested in history, and he was interested in history, and he realized that to, to look at this region and the people and the culture, you had to look at the history to understand the future. Sure. And so they started the Museum of Mountain Lore. 44 years ago, I came, I was hired to come here and to work at the museum 
and we started with the Farm Museum and we started with the festival and we started with an archive of collecting both uh, photographs, music, historical documents and papers about the region and we look at the region as this area of the Blue Ridge Mountains. We uh, have an area we consider our home area of Bedford, uh, Roanoke, Botetot, uh, Franklin, Floyd, Patrick, Carroll, Grayson, um, and the counties down through the Blue Ridge because we're sure. right here on the eastern slopes of the Blue Ridge. So we, we look at Henry County, we also look at Pennsylvania and, and the surrounding area and how this area, the history has affected the people and how it has brought about change today and what's going on today in the region. So the Institute was started to give the students a better feel for what was on, what, the and, history of this area. Uh, that and to honor the culture of the area for the people of the region. Sure. That was as much as anything yeah. is to uh, preserve and present the culture of the area, not to make it look as some hillbilly or something like that, but really what took place here. Absolutely. And um, you know, in, in the 1800s, the Carolina Road went within two miles of Ferrum College, yeah. and that would have been like an interstate highway oh, yeah. at that Oh yeah, the history of the Carolina Road is really, really interesting. You need to do some research on that. And so, um, this area has not been as isolated as a lot of people would like to think. There's always right. been travel going both ways, there's been history going both ways, and um, just like all other areas of the country, you've had uh, good times, you have times that economically are not as good, uh, but it's about the people and how they've taken care of themselves, sure. the community, and how they've survived. And how they've loved the land. This is a beautiful area. Can you imagine going to college here in Far Farum, Virginia? It's just an absolutely beautiful area uh, with really good salt of the earth people that come from good stock, and that's what the Institute uh, covers. Uh, that's very interesting. So, so, the, so when did this building get built? This building uh, is about 12 years old. Okay. And uh, it's part of the college. We raised the money uh, to build the building. Uh, here about four years ago, we did an ex expansion on the building for yeah. a larger archive room for uh, storage of our historical material and for another gallery. So we've uh, expanded the building. We've worked on the Farm Museum since 76 and um, doing different programs. Uh, we had a record, which was a record series for people that remember records. It's now a CD oh, series, yeah. and yeah. that was picked up <laughs> by the Smithsonian, yeah. and it's now part of the Folkway series under wow. the Smithsonian. Uh, so we've done a number of different programs yeah. um, throughout Virginia and throughout this country. Sure. And this, this little uh, uh, Blue Ridge Institute Museum is really getting well known. It's interesting to see that, uh, that a little museum starts out small and continues to grow rather than some of these that are, that are large and all of a sudden they're losing interest and falling apart. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a real testament to uh, the interest in this area. Um, one of the things that I find amazing is people come to this area from all over the world in the fall to see the beautiful foliage on the Blue Ridge Parkway. and. Uh, uh, and this is just a hop, skip, and a jump from that. If you're coming to the Blue Ridge Parkway, you need to pop down to Ferrum and see this Institute and Museum uh, while you're here. And uh, we're going to take another break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about special events, but we're going to talk most specifically about the Blue Ridge Folk Life Festival that's every fall. So you don't want to miss that. We'll be right back. <laughs> We're back uh, for what I think is the most exciting part of the show, and that is to talk about the special events that are going on, the things that that that, that you all do here at the Institute and Museum to make it fresh every time somebody comes back here. So let's start uh, right there. Let's just go right into it. Well, I think the one thing that people know about as much as anything for this is the Blue Ridge Folklife Festival. Oh, yeah. 
and it's been going on for 44 years now. Yeah. And about 30 years ago, we decided to set a date of the fourth Saturday in October. The fourth Saturday in October, Blue Ridge Folklife Festival. Put it on your calendar, come every year. My wife and I just enjoy, we look forward to that every year. It's not the last Saturday, but the fourth. The fourth. And that's the easy way to remember it because, yep. you know, one date, one year, different date, another year, the fourth Saturday. We've been doing it on the fourth Saturday for over 30 years now. Good. And um, the festival started and it still continues as local and regional people doing skills or folkways that are still alive in their families. Yeah. Now we're not looking for reenactors or for people to come in here doing a skill or craft that's been dead for a number of years or something that never took place in this area. Sure. So we're looking at foodways, we're looking at farming activities, uh, automotive activities, anything that takes place within this region. Um, our antique tractor and farm equipment show, That's are people cool. restoring tractors and farm equipment that were in their families and still maintaining it and showing Absolutely. how it operates. I think we're the only festival that's generally open to the public that does the uh, coon dog water race, bench show, and train contest. Yeah. And we've been doing that for a number of years. We do the state mule jumping championship. Yeah. We do a horse pull. Um, we have three stages of traditional music. One of them just of uh, sacred music. Yeah. Um, we do a children's game area, which is not face painting and the modern things, but it's old times games and things for oh, children man. to do that. Mm -hmm. um, we have probably 50 different crafts, both indoors and outside, being uh, demonstrated. And that's the important thing we always stated. The crafts have to be demonstrated. We don't want someone just sitting there selling their wares. They have to demonstrate what they're doing and telling why it was important sure. within their family or community. And we have about 25 different church and civic groups doing food. Yeah. And it's no yeah, hot great dogs. Great food, yeah. good stuff. No hot dogs or hamburgers, yeah. but it's all regional, traditional country cooking. Yeah. And um, there are probably more nonprofit groups that make their annual funds through the food sales here at sure. the festival. So we've always um, looked at this festival as a regional community event and we've kept our prices low so people can bring families and it's just about a homecoming for Franklin County. Sure. And it is, um, I'm telling you, it's one of the best festivals I've ever been to and we, we try to come every year. We've missed a few but we try to come every year. Um, just stuff that you're not going to see anywhere else. Well, we, we try to do that, and we try to have something new in our workshops, whether it's music or whether it's our um, storytelling, such as, you know, we have the uh, still set up that we run water through, and we have the uh, stage where we a have... A working still with yeah. just water. And we have uh, a lot of the uh, older uh, people that had made liquor and the uh, officers that chased them sure. on stage telling stories about what took place and chasing one another and um, it's a chance for people to see, hear and meet some of the people that took part in this activity and one of the special workshops we're doing this year is we're having women of the family whose either parent, father or their brothers or their husbands were involved in that activity talk about it from a woman's point of view, and that's wow. never been done before. So, uh, moonshine from a woman's perspective. Yes. Now, there's an interesting show. So, we're always looking at something <laughs> new and different. We're doing a special. Uh, Kenny Rohr from Danville was leading a workshop on different styles of banjo playing. People, oh, wow. a lot of time, people think, well, there's only one style, and well, there are two styles in bluegrass, and about six in old time music. So. Yeah. We've got different people demonstrating that and sure. Kenny talking about that. So we've got different workshops and different activities going on. Um, 
you can't see the entire festival in one day, so no. you have to come back from year to year. So the days... It's only Saturday. It's one only day. Only Saturday. Oh, my goodness. So you do need to come back from year to year. So it's only one day, um, and from year to year, that we start planning. The day of the festival, we're planning for the next year. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Well, talking to the participants and getting their commitment yes. for the following year. Absolutely. It's a great festival, um, and, and, uh, but there's got to be other things that are going on throughout the year. Uh, we don't want to minimize this one at all. That's a great, great festival, the best thing that happens in this area. And the beauty is, it's the fourth Saturday of the month of October, and that typically is the best color weekend of the fall in this area. Yes, and we have other activities. You'd have to check the uh, website. Last year we had the uh, Eastern meet for the Antique Lincoln Car Club. So oh, yeah. we had uh, some of the oldest Lincoln automobiles in the country that were here for the weekend doing that. Uh, so di different weekends, we have different groups that come in. We've had scouting groups that have come in and had camperies here. Yeah. Uh, we just had the Dulcimer workshop and there were uh, free concerts on Friday and Saturday night of Dulcimer music. Um, like I said, we've got the herb workshop coming up. So we try to find and do different things that other groups are not doing so that we have something a little different for the people when they come right. here. So it's not just a place to come once. It's a, com it's a place to come, see several times, get involved, get in some of the workshops, come to the festival, uh, all kinds of stuff going on. Um, okay, what have we missed in this interview? I think that's about it. We, um, <clears throat> of course, we have a large archive of uh, sound recordings and historical photographs, and we're always trying to document the history of the region and things that took place within the region, okay. and we're always working on different exhibits. You know, several years ago we had the exhibit on um, the making of white liquor, mm -hmm. and that exhibit traveled throughout the state. We did an exhibit on rockabilly music in Virginia. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. And uh, people don't think of that, but it was yeah. all around here. There was yeah. uh, record producers in Martinsville that produced local groups on rockabilly. We've done exhibits on the banjo, on the dulcimer. All of our exhibits are things that took place in this region. Sure. Now, you mentioned the archive of music in this area. If, uh, if someone's from one of the families, um, do you ever work with them? They can get in touch with us and we can tell them if we have anything by their family. Um, we have a lot of sound recordings, of field recordings that we've done. Um, yeah. We've got a large collection of historical of the 78 RPM records that people made. Uh, we're always collecting music from this region and right now actually we're doing a survey on um, African-American religious groups through either the churches or the families oh, cool. from this area, sort of an inventory of the groups because there's a great deal of traditional music within the churches and a lot okay. of times it's hard to find out about. So we're working on that right now. Okay. And, and you're doing a survey. Um, is that something that we can put on uh, the website? Certainly, and okay. they can get in touch with us because right. we're looking at Henry County, Patrick County, and Franklin County on these groups, either whether they're family groups or they're groups within the church, but we want to know about these different singing the, groups. The African American religious singing groups singing within groups. our region. Okay, yes. so go to the website, rockiesramblings.com, and, uh, and we'll have information about how to get in touch with the Institute specifically for this survey that they're doing. If you know anybody that, uh, that has that background and you'd like to see them get in touch, uh, pass the word. That's how, this, that's how these things happen. So that's, that's about it. We're always doing something a little different, always trying to survey and document the folkways of the region. And that's the important thing. Absolutely. Well, this has been this has been fabulous. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the uh, some of the pictures that we've showed through the show. Some of the uh, some of the things we've tried to highlight. All I can do is entice you to get up here, do your own rambling, get up here to the Blue Ridge Institute and Museum, 
and see things for yourself. Get that experience. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, Mr. Moore, it's been a pleasure to uh, chat with you. I wish you well here. I will definitely see you during the uh, Folk Life Festival this coming fall, as I hope to do every fall. And thanks for being on the show. Thank you. I'm home from my rambling up to Ferrum College to see the Blue Ridge Institute and Museum. I hope you enjoyed that show. I enjoyed my visit with uh, Roddy Moore, the co-director of the Institute and Museum. and. Uh, uh, there's much to do there, so you've got to go up there and see that. Uh, if you don't get up there and see that before October, come up there on the fourth Saturday of October. I guarantee you'll see me there. Uh, it's a great festival. It's one of the best in the area, and uh, so you'll want to take part in that. As you're out rambling, I hope that you'll be driving a safe, well-maintained vehicle. Make sure of that. And here's your defensive driving tip for the week. Avoid impaired driving. We all know that driving under the influence of alcohol or illicit drugs is illegal and frankly stupid. But there are other impaired states that we should think about before we get behind the wheel of a vehicle. Uh, many legal drugs, prescription and over-the-counter, can cause drowsiness or worse. Imagine driving with a se severe case of the flu where you can't even stand up. Um, while, in, while under intense pain. Imagine trying to drive a vehicle with the pain of a broken bone. Driving while ex experiencing tremendous emotional upheaval. The bottom line is that if there is some condition that is causing you to have less than f full attention on your driving, you should avoid getting behind the wheel of a vehicle. That vehicle needs your undivided attention. You should not be in the command of a vehicle if you can't give it that undivided and full attention. Remember, you're driving a two-ton chunk of steel that's hurling down the road at, at up to 70 miles an hour. Avoid impaired driving. That's the defensive driving tip for the week. And until my next episode, here's wishing you safe rambling. <laughs>